Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our yearly training to our district foster care points of contact. We are very excited about this new um, approach this year. We have invited our regional points of contact for the Office of Child and Family Services, and this will give us an opportunity to start building connections so that when there, when an issue may arise in our particular areas, we have a name and a face that we can go to for conversation to make sure that our kids' needs are being met in a very timely manner. I am joined by my counterpart at OCFS, Jean Leonard. We'll introduce ourselves in a minute, but we want to ground you in our mission at our two organizations. You can see that our mission at the main DOE is to focus on a whole student approach, encourage innovation among all of you, respect you, provide you information, guidance, professional learning and support, provide you adequate and equitable school funding and resources, and to inspire trust in our school so that you can all be your optimal selves in supporting our students. And Jean, do you want to read your DHHS mission as it applies? Sure. Um, so the DHHS mission is to strive to ensure that Maine children grow up in safe, healthy, and supportive environments and allowing them to thrive throughout their lives. And again, grounding us in our strategic goals for the Maine Department of Education, you'll see a lot of those same words, inspiring trust, helping to develop a robust educator workforce, promoting excellence and equity, ensuring student and school safety, health and well-being. Um, and you will have access to these if you should want to review those again. Our learning objectives for today, by the end of this session, and there will be a quiz, I have to tell you, in order to get your one hour certificate, you do need to pay attention, although you can retake the quiz. But by the end of this session, you will know how to define student in foster care, who should be invited to the best interest determination meeting and what considerations should be made, why the school of origin is so significant, who has the final decision in a best interest determination dispute, what is meant by immediate enrollment, and how transport transportation costs are covered. And who are we today? As I said, I'm Julie Smythe. I'm the proud director of the Office of School and Student Supports here at the Maine Department of Education. We strive to ensure that our schools are inclusive, healthy, safe, and supportive communities where every student and staff member thrive. We endeavor to coordinate resources and programs that promote equitable, psychosocially, physically, and environmentally healthy school communities for all. So if you needed my advice or a thought partner on any of those, I'm your go-to, and I'll connect you with a perfect specialist for discussion. But I'm also your state foster care point of contact, which brings me here today and with my partner, Jean, I'll have you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jean Leonard, I'm one of the regional associate directors um, for the Office of Child and Family Services, Child Welfare. Um, and we're responsible for the oversight of services for children and youth up to the age of 21 and their families. Um, we have child welfare, early care and education, children's behavioral health, and we collaborate to administer the mental health block grant for children and families mental health services. And today, the people you have with you from OCFS are child welfare um, supervisors. And I am also the state um, point of contact now. So if should you have any questions or need anything, always feel free to reach out to me and I can try to help guide you in the right direction. So let's start with um, what is the definition by law of students in foster care? Obviously, um, when our DHHS has placement and responsibilities of the student, they are considered students in foster care. They're placed out of the home. For those of you who are well-versed in McKinney-Vento, students who were previously identified as awaiting foster care fall under this category and not McKinney-Vento. And it includes resource homes, foster and kinship placements, and crisis programs. I don't think we need to go into why educational stability is so important, 
But in 2015, when uh, Every Student Succeeds Act was reauthorized, re um, it was very important that they put some parameters in place. Our students in foster care, as we all experience and know, go through so much instability that finally guidance came down from the US Department of Education that said, we need to make sure that we disrupt their academic life as little as possible. And that's why the parameters that we are going to talk about today have been in place um, since 2015. Um, but as you know, frequent school transitions do have lasting impacts on our students. And that if we maximize educational stability, uh, research has, has proven that it can improve attendance, minimize gaps for these students, and possibly help families stay connected. So that is the premise of why we're here today and why these um, this guidance is so instrumental. Foster care is a Title I Part A provision. And what that ensures is it ensures the educational stability that we are going to review with you today. It establishes specific educational rights. It requires a district foster care appointment excuse me, foster care of point, point of contact, which many of you here today are. It also requires the state foster care point of contact for both DOE, which is me, and DHHS, which was Bobby Johnson last year when we presented, and this year and going forward, it will be Jean Leonard. If you are not sure that your information is up to date, we do have the link to, and you may already have it um, starred on your desktops that to look up the foster care points of contact for any school, any SAU in Maine, go to your NEO dashboard. This is where you look it up. It's previously the superintendent search. And we do have a page of helpful links that I sent to, um, some email addresses that I've had from last year, and I will make sure all of you in attendance today will receive those as well. We wanna make sure your information is up to date. So what are these educational rights that um, really were solidified in 2015 and hopefully have become commonplace in your districts? If they haven't become commonplace, we are here to support you any way we can. The first is that a best interest determination needs to be held as soon as you have knowledge of a foster care situation possibly changing, whether it's a student of yours who is moving to another location or you hear of a student in foster care coming into your, um, your area. So having that best interest determination, and we'll go over the specifics of that in a minute. Immediate enrollment is also part of those educational rights. Paperwork is not a factor. Um, IEPs, not supposed to be a factor. Immediate enrollment truly means immediate enrollment. So we are here to support you in any way we can um, to make that happen. We want the least amount of disruption as possible. And then also the school of origin and how transportation is impacted or supported through that. probably goes without saying that school of origin is the school the student was attending when placed in foster care. Um, the ideal situation would be that the foster care would be in the general vicinity of the school so there was minimal disruption, but we know that that doesn't always occur. Our guidelines in the state of Maine clearly state that the student should remain enrolled in their school of origin unless that best interest determination is conducted and it is decided not to be in the student's best interest. But I'm sure you all um, realize how important it is to have students stay where they are so they can have that continuity as much as possible. So when it comes to best interest determinations, I'm sure there are times that as the district point of contact, you feel like you're on an island because you are the only one in your SAU. But you should have a collaborative team when it comes to figuring out what is in the best interest of student, a student in foster care. So it should be conducted collaboratively. The student's unique needs should be considered, and we'll go over that in a moment. Um, but until that best interest determination is completed, the student should remain in their school of origin. 
We do have some sample procedures and forms to help you if, if this is new to you. At the bottom of every sheet is the disclaimer that it is not required, but encouraged to facilitate and document. It is required for you to have the best interest determination, but how you go about that, you do have that autonomy, but we have provided as much guidance as possible. And for those of you who like visuals, we have visuals. For those of you who like check marks, so we've really tried to um, change that up for you and give you multiple options to help you in facilitating these best interest determinations for placement. So who should be involved in the best interest determination? Here is the list that we have collated as, as a state. Obviously, if the student is of appropriate age and can be an advocate, we strongly recommend that the student be a part. Um, the parent guardian, if possible, the resource parent, the educational decision maker, i.e. the surrogate parent, maybe the guardian ad litem and depending on who's involved, the caseworker, potentially the supervisor, you as the district foster care point of contact who will be facilitating the meeting, maybe you have special education there, a school counselor, anyone who knows the student well, if possible. I have educational decision maker highlighted because if the student is in foster care and has an IEP, the student is assigned an educational decision maker. And the person who is most well-versed in, in that is actually here with us today. And I'm going to ask Sarah to hop on and be much more articulate than I could be about these expectations. So Sarah. Um, thanks, Julie. So um, students in foster care, um, and then a small subset of them have special education and um, a right of, of a student in special education is to have an educational surrogate parent. Also in Maine Unified Special Education Regulations, as well as in Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, foster parent is listed in the definition of parent. So if you, uh, if the child is in a foster home, then the foster parents hold all special education rights. That means that the DHHS guardian holds regular education rights, but anything that comes out of the special ed office, um, the foster parents hold the rights to sign those papers, to give those consents and, and those sorts of things. Um, there are some students who are in DHHS custody that, all, that have special ed that are not living in foster homes. They're living in group homes. They're living in residential treatment centers. Um, they have a right also to an educational surrogate parent. And I have a list of volunteers of people who are willing to do that for them. So if you know of a foster student who is not in a resource home um, and does not have parents per se, then um, there's a process to apply for an educational surrogate parent, which is on um, the special ed website. And there it is. And there's my contact information, Sarah Ferguson, and that is my phone number. Sarah, I think I put a couple other helpful Oh, that great. Is... Super. Thank you. Um, and so this would be the request that you would fill out. And if you would know somebody who knows the student and would be a good person um, to uh, maybe a former foster parent, sometimes they like to stay with their kids um, who are placed in group homes or placed in residential treatment places. Um, then, um, or if DHHS approves the biological parent, could also serve as the educational surrogate parent. Um, and so that's what it looks like. If you don't know anybody, 
then I have, again, I slight, like I said, I have a list. And so when I appoint an educational surrogate parent, I always request to make sure that their name gets put on all of the special ed paperwork. So um, when, when uh, foster parents get special ed paperwork, their name should be on it. Also, sometimes schools put the DHHS guardian's name on it. Uh, because they still, of course, have the regular ed rights um, and need to know what's going on with the kiddo. But the foster parents' names should be on all special education paperwork that comes out of the special ed office. Sarah, thank you so much. And I'm hoping okay. you'll stick around if there are questions at the end. I sure will. Thank you. And then we also included the rights and responsibilities. So they'll have that as a copy. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Julie. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jean to talk a little bit about the district points of contact and a little bit of what you can expect in your conversation with them later today. Hi, um, so we have um, district points of contact who I think we probably haven't um, done a, a great job explaining to them what their roles are um, or included them in some of the things that they probably should have been. So we're starting fresh with that. Um, and I you know, really wanted to make sure that you all got to put faces with names and, and who you are. And so I think for the district points of contact, your job when we, after this meeting is really gonna be to reach out to um, your peers and your staff and let them know that if um, there needs to be a meeting that you should be included. And part of the reason is, you know, we do have some caseworker turnover and they may not understand um, necessarily that the child has the right to stay in their school system um, or should be staying in their school system. And so you can sort of be that continuity throughout the case. Um, and so hopefully people will be coming to you and asking you more questions about or getting you involved in situations when there needs to be a determination of where the child should be attending school. Um, so in your breakout rooms, you'll have a chance to connect with the, the folks that cover the um, points of contacts for the school districts in your areas. Wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. So now that you know who should be in that conversation, what are the, some of the things that you should consider? Um, and this is not a complete list because every student is individual, but taking into account the time of year, um, maybe there's a week left in the, or two weeks left in the trimester, and you have a high school student that you want to finish out the coursework. Um, maybe you know about um, a future change that's going to happen that it, it would make sense for the student not to stay where they are. There's are so many considerations. Um, the climate of the school for the student, um, how many placements, maybe it's a student who has come from out of state and has just gone to so many places. So multiple options when it comes to, and we list those, all of these out for you to help and are always here as a thought partner for you. Transportation should not be a determining factor in any of this. Now, obviously, if the student moves two and a half hours away, um, and it doesn't make sense to transport a student for two and a half hours. But I have heard of situations where a student in Augusta um, was transported to Portland because it really was in their best interest and kudos to those districts for making that happen for that student. It was a huge success story, but it was not easy. Oh, this is, this is, this is self-care right here. Do 10 box jumps onto a step. Did you see that come across on my screen? Yes, still there. Yeah, I don't always I don't always do it, but I try. Okay. Districts and DHHS must collaborate to ensure students who need transportation to remain in their school of origin can do so. And this is where that relationship building really becomes important. I just got off a call an hour ago with the national, all of the SEA points of contact. 
and transportation is a struggle everywhere. And the we ask you to think outside the box. We ask you to try to build up your own cadre of, of supports within the, the schools, but we know it's not easy. Um, but the more we can collaborate and talk about the, the what is best for transporting uh, student in foster care, um, it truly is in, in the best interest. But we do know how difficult it is and we are here to be thought partners, throw ideas, um, think outside the box, connect you with resources if we can. And Julie, just to add in there too, part of what um, your you as points of contact can do can share, you know, some of the brainstorming that you've had in other situations that was was helpful, you know, with with different groups so that you can um, come up with solutions. So that's another reason why you should be in those meetings to provide information you've learned from other circumstances. So the MOU that DHHS and DOE signed in 2016 after the law was put into motion, these were the steps that were written. This can be revisited at some point. I have not reopened the conversation, but it doesn't mean that um, if you were to provide us feedback and ask us to reopen it and relook at it, we certainly um, can come up with a plan to do that. But what it what the MOU currently states and, and what we are following is that if a student has transportation service as part of their IEP, we, DOE covers that and Lori Freeman is your contact and can I, DOE reimburses. Sarah, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so yes, DOE would reimburse um, because DOE is responsible for um, for for educational um, costs for students who are in DHHS custody, um, but not every kid who has special education requires transportation. It's only if they require some special kind of transportation in order to get to school. So there are very few students who actually have transportation in their IEP. Um, and it wouldn't be written in just so that they could get to their school of origin. So if they can ride a regular bus without an aid or without, um, you know, special equipment or uh, then they wouldn't have it in their IEP. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I tried to cover that with IEP with transportation service, but I probably should improve the wording on that and we'll look well, to do that. Right. And I think that that's good, but I just don't know that people outside of special education understand that, you know, it's if, if they have a particular super special need. Yep. Thanks. And I'm seeing that my second bullet point could be confusing because if the student does not have an IEP, but it should be does not have an IEP that specifies transportation services. Yes. Check, check with the person you are going to meet today or with your case, the caseworker and see how, um, what assistance might be available, if any. And here is the, um, the sticky wicket sometimes, most of the time, is that if child welfare, um, if we cannot assist with transportation, then the costs are split 50-50 between the school districts. So the school where the student resides and the school of origin where we want that student to stay. It's a 50-50 split according to the MOU. Another um, important element that I am hopeful you are all in understanding, are all understanding and, and able to do is immediate enrollment. And this is very similar to our McKinney-Vento expectations. Um, document, documentation is not required. So this would be a, a student in foster care is, is coming to your district. The best interest determination has been completed and it, it is said that, you know what, the student does need to go where they um, are living. It is in their best interest your district needs to enroll them immediately with or without documentation. I know that's easier said than done. Um, and then what DHHS will provide to you, um, emergency contact, residence, 
record release transportation needs, they will work with you around that in the meantime. But we want as limited disruption as possible for our students. If there were to be a dispute of um, that best interest determination, DHHS does have the final decision-making authority. It isn't something that comes to us at DOE. Um, the, our MOU was created to say that DHHS has that final say. All right, I am going to whoops, stop sharing. There are a couple of questions in the chat that I think um, I started to answer and then thought, well, these are probably not directed at me. So um, the they're really pretty much the same thing about CPS offering help for transportation or having the ability, ability to offer help. Um, so I don't know if you, if the, the CPS um, partners want to answer that because you have right. probably a better sense of how things are happening in your districts. I don't mind jumping in. Um, so I'm in district three, which is the Andrew Oxford and Franklin County area. And um, we have, we have two programs, um, Ride Source and Western Main Transportation that we um, sometimes can use. Unfortunately, sort of like what we're seeing everywhere is there's like a shortage of drivers. Um, and so, you know, if they have openings and available drivers, we have some, some success in transporting kids. But um, I can tell you sort of what we're seeing a lot is like, it's if it's more than sort of like a half an hour or hour, there, there's a lot of pushback on us. Um, in some immediate circumstances, like, you know, we talked about like how much longer is left of the school year and, and you know, factors like that. We've had staff that will alternate shifts between picking kids up and dropping them off, but that's not ideal, obviously, um, for a long-term, you know, success for, for that to work, but. I, well, oh, sorry, Jean, have had, um, uh, I'm in District 7, Washington, Hancock County. Um, we had children that were placed, uh, originated in Hancock County at NDI and neighboring schools, and they were placed in Washington County in the uh, Columbia Falls area and transported them to the near the school's nearest bus stop um, or transfer spot and they got on the bus that way but did it through our transportation agency um, it was a sibling group of three um, and with a consistent driver um, arranged to have so that the same person was transporting them through our uh, and sorry it's DCP now um, uh, to the school bus transfer part. Lindsay, it looked like you were going to say something. Yep, I was going to say, um, we also sometimes use like KV cap. I'm from District 5, um, Kennebec and Somerset counties. Um, but I think there's, again, the staff shortages. And I think we we're seeing like, yeah, you know, the kids were missing school, you know, when the volunteer calls out and it kind of put a, people in a pickle sometimes. Um, and again, for short term, sometimes we're able to use like case aids, um, that sort of thing. But it, it's definitely difficult to do that like longer term. It's kind of more like the kids come into care. We're able to kind of pick those things up like in the short term, but definitely it's harder for the long term just because that could end up being a lot of kids. So. And some foster parents are awesome about transporting too, if it's like out of district, so. Probably boils down to what everyone has um, available. So what I'd like to do, and we have never done this before, so I may be needing some grace on this. Um, we would like you to go into small groups based on your area. We have eight rooms, eight districts. And Jean, um, can you set the stage for what we were thinking? We'll do introductions so people can put names to faces. And then what else were we thinking for the small group? Yeah, so I had sent um, out to the OCFS staff a list um, of 
what we had thought they would discuss was the reality of like how many kiddos in our district um, are in foster care and are school aged. And so I tried to get a report of the ones that were actually in school, but was really only able to get the age group. So from five to 18. So it's not, it's not perfect, but um, broken out by district. So talking about this is how many kids in care we have um, that are school aged and sort of talking about the realities of um, kiddos moving placements. You know, we don't have a lot of foster homes. And so talking about really the realities of um, there may be, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, three or four placements. And so why it's super important for them to maintain in their school of origin if they can, because I don't want to have the whole discussion for you. But um, talking about the realities of the situation about kids in foster care um, and um, foster parents, the shortage of foster parents um, and the realities of kids moving and vacancies of caseworkers. Um, you know, sort of how many workers do you have in your district and how many of those positions are vacant? Uh, so our partners can sort of understand from each other what the reality of the situation really is. Okay. So we have eight rooms, eight districts, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and close up shop, answer any other questions you might have and send you on your way for a fantastic afternoon. Rooms are open. Here we go. All right, from current slide. Okay, you will contact information and the slides contain Sarah's information as well. These are our so, phone numbers. You can sorry, text us. Julie, all I'm seeing is black. Is anybody else seeing her screen? Nope, black. Nope. Just black, oh, it's man. just turning. It says Julie Smythe has started sharing, sharing the screen. But it, it's the, but you know, it's that time of day. It is. So you will have a copy of these with that contact information. But the most exciting slide that I'm not able to show you is a save the date. So now you have to do old school, pick up your pencil and write down March 28th, 3.30. It is a Thursday. It's a few months out. I hope it trickles along sort of, I think, um, but we just want to come back together um, in a few months and check in on you and support you in whatever way we can. I am now going to link your, hopefully, exit slip. Let's see if I can do that. And Julie, you had a, um, a couple other links that you were going to send along with the PowerPoint. Is that right? Yes, I have the PowerPoint slides. I have all of the links, so you can just click on them. Um, next, this was my second time, so third time will be a charm next year. You'll have all the links ahead of time. Um, please click on this form, complete your quiz. You're going to love taking the quiz because what school person, or I forgot, we don't have just school people here, but it'll be good for you to have a fun little quiz and then you get your certificate. <laughs> If you are not able to click on it, let me know. I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you do each and every day. You are rock stars, you are heroes, you are amazing. We are blessed to have you in this state. And I look forward to being your thought partner, to supporting you and um, here for you anytime. I'm going to stop that recording now.